Let's give our attention to the reading of God's Word. This is Psalm 51. For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bowls will be altered. Offered on your altar. That's Psalm 51. First Kings 15.5 are near the top of my list of the saddest verses in the Bible. This is what it says. David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands all the days of his life, except except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. David has an amazing testimony in his life, except. And what a horrendous exception the matter of Uriah the Hittite was. How out of character with David's lifelong integrity, how schizophrenically uh, opposed to David's compassion that he normally showed, and most of all, how antithetical to David's lifelong fear of the Lord. The title of Psalm 51 mentioned another one of the parties that were injured in David's exception. It reads, For the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So Psalm 51 is our psalm for today and next Sunday. Uh, So many of the psalms that we've looked at already have shown us all the enemies David had and all the perils that David had in his life. Um, But he was never on such dangerous ground as in this exception. The Psalms have given us a lot of hope for uh, and uh, truth about living in our broken world. But what, what do we do when our, our world is broken and we broke it. What do we do when we, we look around and we're standing in rubble and uh, destruction and misery and it's of our own making? Psalm 51 holds amazing truth and hope 
for such situations. But we're just going to get started today. Uh, today we're going to get the backstory about David's exception. And next Sunday we'll look at the psalm and David's repentance and restoration. So today we're just really unpacking the, the intro to David's psalm. And the details that we'll use come from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. It starts out uh, right at verse 1 by saying, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David remained in Jerusalem. That's how the story of David's tragic exception begins. David wasn't where he was supposed to be as a king out defending his country. And that's what put David where he wasn't supposed to be, wandering around on his rooftop in the middle of the night. Looking out over the parapets, looking down on his unsuspecting neighbors. One neighbor was taking advantage of the coolness of the night and the supposed privacy of her own rooftop. And she was bathing. David may not have had evil intentions when he got up and started looking out on his city. But by the time he had lingered long enough on that moonlit figure to realize, as the text tells us, that she was of exceedingly beautiful form. By that time, David had taken his first faltering step off the straight path of his life. He'd started into the exception. His next action was a headlong leap towards destruction. The story continues, David sent someone to find out about her. Now what we've heard, the seeing and the sending, are two separate verses in my Bible, but they're one sentence. It's almost as if, I mean, it doesn't tell us this for sure, but there wasn't any time wasted between David seeing and David sending. He didn't wait. He didn't reflect on what was happening in his heart and his life. He acted on impulse, on passion. And how often that has been the, the ruin of a man or woman of God. That's why Proverbs 4.26 counsels, give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Oh, that David's feet had led him back to bed. He could have laid down and gone to sleep with a prayer of repentance and asking for strength against temptation. Instead, his feet took him to find a steward in his house. What must this man of thought who knew David when David's request came? How did David communicate this burning curiosity? There's a woman who lives three houses west of my bedroom balcony. Go find out who she is. That must have seemed a strange request to the servant. He sensed something was out of order with his master. Listen to how he reports back what he's discovered. Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now, why did he have to give all that information? It's like he knows something's going wrong with David. And he says, hey, the woman you're asking about is the daughter of someone you know. And more than that, she's the wife of someone you know, David. But it was too late. David's heart was already set on a downward course. Verse 4 says, Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. A lot of commentators and pastors call what happened here, say what David did was rape. Uh, we're, we're not told that in the story. There's a word that the messengers took her physically, uh, can make it sound like it was against her will. Other than that, there's no indication that David forced himself on Bathsheba. But when the king comes to get you, when there's that difference in authority, when your husband works for the king, 
This was a gross abuse of David's leadership and power and position no matter what happened in the bedroom. The story, if you read it, is stark and simple in its telling. It's almost like the, the writer of 2 Samuel was uh, pained to spend very much time talking about these dark deeds of David. His next sentence says, Then she went back home, the woman conceived, and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. What would David do next? What I know about David, what I've read in the Psalms, what I've read from his life, he, he would confess, he would repent. But I wonder if his mind raced through uh, different scenarios about his sin going public. There was no, I mean, this is out there now. I remember, you know, you remember when it was a scandal for a public leader uh, to have a liaison or an affair. It's prerequisite now for being in public office sometimes, it seems like. But there was no public way to repent of David's sin and David's culture. Under the law that God had given, adultery, taking another man's wife, was punishable by death. Perhaps as king, he might pull strings, he might play the power card and get away with it. But then what would it mean for there to be an illegitimate heir to his throne? Well, David's pace on the path away from God raced forward. He tried to cover his sin. He sent to the battlefield for Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. The soldier arrived and David feigned interest in a report on how the battle was going. But then David sent Uriah home to his wife. And he must have been thinking, maybe we can still salvage this. Surely after all this time away, Uriah will want to be with his wife. There's still a chance we can make the world believe this is his child. There was a flaw in David's plan. Uriah the Hittite was an honorable man. You can read what he said. Uh, but Uriah was uh, refused to enjoy the comforts of wife and home because all of the rest of the soldiers were on the battlefield. They were roughing it, and so he decided to rough it too. He slept outside with the other servants. In other words, he refused to do the exact thing that King David had decided to do. David decided, oh, they can go handle the battle, and I'll stay home in the comfort of my palace. David um, kept Uriah another day when he found out that he'd uh, refused to go home. This time he uh, thought he'd help the process on a little. He got Uriah drunk and then sent him home. And uh, all of you know that alcohol has exposed the character flaws of many men and women. But in Uriah's case, it exposed his integrity. Because drunk or sober, he had his honor and his wits about him. And verse 13 of 2 Samuel 11 says, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. By this time, you would think that David was just going, wow, this guy is better than me. Uh, He's got more integrity than I do. He's the kind of man that I've tried to be my whole life. So how did David repay such an honorable servant? He sent Uriah back to the battlefront carrying his own death warrant. A sealed message to General Joab that read, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. How could David, a man of such bravery, I mean, he faced a giant when he was a boy. How could he become such a coward when confronted with his own sin? Trying to save face when we sin has made cowards of us all at some point. 
in our lives. It was Adam's first inclination after sin entered the world. He said, first thing I got to do is get some leaves so that I can hide myself from my wife. And then I have to hide from God. Our disposition to cover our sin has produced the world's lamest excuses. Uh, uh, I'm Uh, It's fathered billions of lies. It has resulted in endless pain and misery. It's added immeasurably to the pain of our broken world. What good would it do to kill Uriah? David couldn't hide the fact that Bathsheba was pregnant. But with Uriah out of the way, David could marry his widow and claim the child as his own. Maybe his subjects wouldn't do the math. Or maybe they would assume that good King David was magnanimously looking out for the family of one of his fallen heroes. Uriah, and the text says, some of the men in David's army died in that cover-up. So it wasn't just Uriah that lost his life. I don't know how that happened, but sometimes there's more honor among soldiers. They might not have obeyed the order. They might not have drawn back from Uriah, but they went too close to the wall. And some, we don't know how many, but more than the intended victim died. King Joab, the general, writes back to David. And he's he's worried that David will still get upset when he hears about the outcome of the battle. And uh, David hears the report that Uriah and some men, actually the report comes back, some men perished in the battle and Uriah the Hittite, just in case you were wondering, David. And he writes back to his general, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Now Joab was a, a ruthless man. If you've ever read the story of Joab, he was just do-whatever-it-takes kind of guy. It might not have bothered him too much uh, what took place, but when Bathsheba heard the news, the Bible says she lamented over her dead husband. Whatever happened between her and David, there was some love and some feeling for Uriah. She lamented for her dead husband. But as soon as it was socially acceptable, when the period of mourning was over, David married Bathsheba. David had succeeded in hiding his sin from all but a a close inner circle. I mean, who knew besides Joab, a couple of household servants, his new wife? Who knew? There was at least one other person who was very close to David who knew. The last verse of 2 Samuel 11 reads, but the thing David did, but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. That's really a, a little weak compared to the Hebrew. The Hebrew says, the thing was evil in the eyes of the Lord. How could this be the same David? The, the sweet singer of Psalms. Uh, you, you've heard the testimony about David's life. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. That's God talking about David. And um, in the New Testament, uh, we have this inspired summation of David's life, like his tombstone. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is from, the, uh, from what I read you earlier. David had done what was right. This, this is repeated that David was a man after God's own heart in the New Testament. But this is what I read you earlier. David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands all the days of his life. I would love if that were my epitaph, but not this part, except. He'd done everything that God had commanded, except lust and adultery and lying and murder. That's a pretty big except. That word except is a warning to all of us. 
no matter where you think you are, no matter what your track record has been in life, no matter how far along you are in life, no matter what you think your walk with God is like, you don't know how far you are or how close you are to that first stumbling step into a horrible exception in your life. That's why we get encouragements. In the, the, the reason that we don't do uh, the Christian life by ourselves, but we get together and we encourage one another, uh, you know, person to person and with the word and with singing. Uh, Hebrews 3.13 says, encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It can happen to anybody in the room. You can be hardened little by little by sin's deceitfulness. David was so close with the Lord. And if this could happen to David, no one is safe from a disastrous exception. Knowing the scriptures as I do, one of my lifelong prayers is, God, let me finish well. Let me not make the David mistakes, the Solomon mistakes. Back to the intro, Psalm 51, we heard that Nathan came to David after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. How long between the sin and the confrontation? We're not told, except I think from a careful reading of the story, the, the text suggests that it was after the birth of the child that came from this union. So David had been hiding for at least nine months, maybe longer. But then God went looking for David. God would not allow David to get away with covering his sin. God revealed the whole affair to the prophet Nathan and sent Nathan to confront David. Nathan pre presented this case to the king for a decision. I, I've got the story I, I need to tell you about a man, David, uh, he was a rich rancher. He had many sheep, but on a night when he had some guests and he, he wanted a meal, uh, instead of feasting on something from his own flock, he robbed a poor neighbor who only had one lamb. In fact, that lamb was like a pet to him. And he devoured that instead. Second Samuel 12 tells us that by the time Nathan finished his story, David, it says, burned with anger against the man, and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Not all of David's wisdom had left him. He could still spot sin in someone else's life. He could even correctly quote the law of Moses. He handed down the exact penalty for sheep stealing. Fourfold repayment. The law provided for a way to make atonement if you stole someone's lamb. There was no provision to atone for David's sin. Both adultery and murder were capital sins in Israel under God's law. David should have died. He handed down the right sentence. This man deserves to die because the next thing uh, after he had shouted that out and it was echoing on the palace halls, Nathan said, David, you're the man. Here's a good example of a man with a log in his own eye trying to get at dust in someone else's. Again, a warning to all of us. With the judgment you use, you will be judged and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. My, de my, my judgment, David said, is that the man deserves to die. You're right, David. You are the man. The story of David's life is outrageous. But we haven't reached the most shocking part yet. Only after Nathan had laid out David's sin do we hear the most scandalous turn in this story. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken 
away your sin, you are not going to die. What? David is a liar, a murderer, maybe a rapist. What about just consequences of his sin? What, what about the parents who needlessly lost sons in the battle? At least one life, wife, probably more, lost a husband. The same used, grieved woman was about to lose her infant son because of David's sin. The sword would never depart from David's household. That was part of the consequences of David's sin. His, sons, his sins would be repeated in his sons. His son Amnon became a rapist. Absalom murdered Amnon. Had David not appointed Solomon king, his son Ad, Adonijah would have become a murderer also. Lots of collateral damage in this story. But David simply admits, I have sinned against the Lord. And God's prophet announces, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Earlier in Bible study, again, I can't believe we're not coordinating, but I think the Holy Spirit is coordinating. We were talking about grace, mercy and grace, not getting what we deserve and getting more than we ever could ask for. God suspended the death sentence that was prescribed in his own law and he removed David's sin. Why is this story in the Bible? Why does the, why does the Bible tell stories about its greatest heroes and include stuff like this? You know, if I wanted to build up a king, I wouldn't include this story. There'd just be a a little exception about this exception. Why put all the dirty laundry out there for us to read? If you've ever wondered that, if you wonder why is it in the Old Testament and why are we talking about it on Sunday morning, I would point you to 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12. Talking about the Old Testament in general, these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages is, has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. That's why this story, one of the reasons why this story is in the Bible. Learn from the stories of David and others and don't be so proud or careless as to think that would never happen to me. I'm impervious to exceptions. But beyond that, the stories aren't about the people as much as they're about God. <laughs> it's not about David, it's about God. We're supposed to learn something about the character of God. This story is supposed to scandalize us twice. Once by David's duplicity and sin, we're just supposed to go, how, how could that happen with David? But then we're scandalized by God's removal of that sin. How could God do such a thing? How could the righteous judge of the universe suspend his own law? You probably heard that before, but you know, uh, a, a, raper, a rapist, a murderer, uh, a fraud is in court and, and the judge just cancels all the charges. Everybody knows he's guilty. And the judge just lets him go. We'd be out to get the judge, right? We'd want him off the bench. Somebody got in, you know, somebody put some money in that judge's pocket. Something happened. So how could God do such a thing? He's a righteous judge, right? How could God forgive all that? It's a, little, a legitimate question. And actually, until we uh, begin to come to grips with the answer, you're never going to understand Psalm 51. That's why we're doing this sermon in two parts. How did the holy, righteous God of Israel suspend his own law, including the penalties, and remove David's sin? Nathan's pronouncement was that God had taken away David's sin. Where did he take it? I mean, did he just conjure it out of existence? No, when 
God revealed his nature to Moses. He made two promises. I, Yahweh, am a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and rich in faithful love and truth, forgiving wrongdoing, rebellion, and sin, but I will not leave the guilty unpunished. Which is it? Is he a a forgiving God who gets rid of people's sin, or is he a God who will punish people for their sin? In David's story, uh, which is it? Is God the forgiver of wrongdoing, rebellion, and sin? Certainly sums up what David did. Or is he the one who will not let the guilty escape, escape punishment? How can he be both? That's the question of the ages. Well, Nathan's words, he has taken away your sin, have kind of a strange Hebrew uh, uh, concept behind them. They could be translated, God has caused your sin to cross over, or God has passed over your sin. It's kind of a two-perspective word there. If God removes sin, to where does he remove it? Listen to the Apostle Paul, Romans 3, 23 to 26. I'm going to read this in the English Standard Version because something comes across a little more clearly. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When we read a story like David's, we shouldn't stop at how could a holy God suspend his law with just penalties and remove David's sin. It's supposed to spur us to ask, How could God do that for anyone? How could God do that for me? I'll keep reading. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. God, Jesus Christ, God the Son, put forward as an atoning sacrifice. And I think there's something in that phrase, put forward. You're saying, I know this. When I placed my faith in the work of Christ on the cross, I was justified freely by his grace. Uh, It was just as if I'd never sinned. But here's the tie back to David. I'm continuing in, in Romans. This was to show God's righteousness Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the former sins. The Greek and the Hebrew words, the word that Nathan used for your sins have passed over, and the Greek word are synonyms. In his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. David's sin was passed over. And it, did, and it says it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God justified David by faith. We'll find that out later. David placed his faith in the mercy and forgiveness of God and the character of God. And God credited that to him as righteousness and passed over his sins and the penalties but he passed them over to Christ. He he held all those sins in his forbearance. And they crossed over to the one hanging on the cross in David's place and in mine. God has never neglected to punish the guilty. He is a just God. But in his divine forbearance, he has suspended the sentence until Jesus Christ could cancel the debt on the cross. And so God is our justifier while remaining just for anyone who has faith in Jesus. I feel like I should be hearing a hallelujah or something. Amen. Amen. Something, yeah. Christ's Sinless sacrifice, sacrificial death on the cross was enough to pay David's duplicity, adultery, and murder. It was enough to pay for 
my sin, which is great, and it was enough to pay for your sin. Have you received that forgiveness through Jesus Christ? Because if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, it says you're going to be transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the Son He loves. You're going to be brought from death to life. You're going to cross over. (laughs) And all your exceptions will be paid for. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how good it is to be with your people and to celebrate your grace as we have in song. We sang a little more actually than usual this morning, but how fitting when we reflect on your grace and your mercy. It was said in Sunday school today that there are many versions of God out there and, and most of them very dark and, and, uh, and sad. But you are the God who reveals yourself as merciful, long-suffering, patient. That is who you are. And yet you have found a way to be truly, completely honest to your nature. Being both just and the one who makes us just as if we would, had never sinned. So Father, some of us maybe right now are grieving over sin that we committed. Maybe long past sin that still is having ripples and effects in our life. Or current sin that we, we feel has distanced us from your love and your mercy. Father, forgive us. Have mercy on our exceptions and you have in Jesus Christ. Help us not to take that lightly. It's not as as if some people in Paul's days basically said, hey, where sin abounds, grace abounds more, so sin it up. And Paul said, by no means. Understanding what Christ endured for us drives us to holiness and a desire to please you in all our ways. So Father, we pray for these divine gifts. They're not things that we can do on our own. They're works of the Holy Spirit in our lives, keeping us clear-eyed and vigilant and in your word and being cleansed by your word, being sanctified by your truth. Your word is truth. That's what Jesus prayed for us. Keep us in the path, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name and let the redeemed say, Amen.